Okay. Welcome back to Everyday Miracles Podcast. This is Julie Hedenborg, and I am your host today. I have a lovely guest. Her name is Cindy Veenstra. She's from Kalamazoo, Michigan. She's joining me today to tell a beautiful story about God's protection and his provision. Um, I met Cindy years back at a real estate event that my husband was um, involved with, and Honestly, I was in kind of a funk personally at the time. I was just transitioning and um, I ended up talking with Cindy and she just blessed me by sharing some things that had happened in her life and I was really lifted up. So I hope that you get the same feeling that I did. She's, she's amazing. So um, she's a grandmother of 12 children, less than seven, and she is a very busy real estate professional. She's been a teacher. She's been a missionary. Um, her story today is related to her missionary experience. So, so Cindy, welcome. Thanks, Julie. It's good to be here. <laughs> so take us back, if you would, best that I can remember, um, I, is when you told me about you were, I think you were pregnant, and I'm not sure what you guys were doing before the missionary call, but I know your husband got a call to go into mission work. And if you could just take us around that point and start. Sure. Well, my husband had started a business when he was in college. And one day it was a used shipping pallet reclining business. Not exactly <laughs> an exciting business. He came home and he said, so the business is profitable. I'm going to sell it. I was like, wait. This is when we can just now start to get money. And he said, no, nope, I think we're going to go into full-time missions. And so that was our entree. And he, the next day, put the business up for sale. We didn't know where we were going. And I was like, okay, that's a little further step of faith than I'm quite ready to take. But he said, no, I think God will bless that. Well, it ended up, we, we ended up in the Philippines about eight months later. Our house sold to the first person who came through. Our business sold the week after that. The day that our, our business sold, I met someone in the grocery store who said, oh, I heard you're going on the mission field. I didn't even know that others knew. And they said, we just bought a store, uh, a big storage facility. You can store all your stuff for as long as you are on the mission field for free. So that was the provision God gave us to say, this is what I want you to do. So we went there with a nine month old son and he had been born in the car on the way to Cadillac, Michigan. So I, I have very short, uh, short labor. And um, we had a second son who was born in the Philippines two weeks early and I, went for that uh, birth I went from one contraction took me from uh, two to seven a second contraction took me from seven to ten <sighs> and then the third contraction he was born <clears throat> so, oh, wow I'm jealous <laughs> yeah, I know I, I don't like to tell that to people who have been laboring for 25 hours right yeah. <laughs> but anyway I was pregnant again and the pregnancy was going well. I went to the OB in the Philippines, and this was in 1980s. Okay, so things were um, well. It, we we kind of compared the hospital situation to 10 years behind where we were in the U.S. Okay, mm -hmm. that was kind of just a traditional. That's how we kind of thought about it, mm -hmm. but. My OB was trained in the States and she was a fabulous woman. And I went to see her and she told me the day, this was at 26 weeks pregnant. And she said, I'm going to the States tomorrow. So I'll be gone for a few weeks, but you're doing fine. I said, okay. Well, that evening I started contractions. And <clears throat> knowing my birth history, <clears throat> contractions mean I'm going to have a baby. So the next morning I went to the, the replacement person who was working, um, you know, taking over her practice. And that person was not somebody that I felt really comfortable with. 
and she gave me some pills and said, well, take these. You won't have the baby for another six or eight hours. And I was like, oh my goodness. Hours. <clears throat> and back I'm then, only 26 weeks pregnant. And that's not technically viable back then. That's, that's not, not at good. all. Yeah. Especially since we were living in a city that had electricity one hour a day. So there was not a generator or a respirator in the, in the hospital. So I started getting kind of angry at God mm -hmm. for being there. And my father-in-law was a retired physician. So I got on the phone and I said, what would they do in the United States if somebody presented like I am right now? And he thought for a minute and he said, well, last week I read about a drug that was just introduced um, and approved by the FDA, and they probably would give you that drug, and it would probably stop your contractions. And I said, what's the name of it? He told me, and he said, but Cindy, you're not going to find it in the Philippines. It was just introduced here. And so I said, okay, so what would be the other things they would do, right? He said, you need to find a, a high-risk pregnancy physician. And so I got off the phone and tears were streaming down my face. And I called our pediatrician, who was also trained in the United States. And I said, okay, I need a high-risk pregnancy doctor. Is, do you know of one? <laughs> Are there, is there even such a thing? And she said, I do know one in Manila. So that was about an hour uh, plane flight. She said, you fly to, to Manila today. I'll make sure you get in. And so my husband and I left our two kids home with our household helper. And we flew right to Manila. And we walked into this doctor's office. They saw us coming and said, <clears throat> come right in. The doctor's waiting for you. We, we got in. And he asked for my history, you know, with the pregnancy. And I told him, and then I also told him, and I need to tell you that mm -hmm. my pregnancies are very, very, my, my, um, my births are very, very quick. So and we call that precipitous labor. <laughs> yes. Very much precipitous. <laughs> well, he said, well, that's okay. Um, I just got back from Harvard and Yale last week. And I said, oh, what were you doing there? He said, well, I was the lead doctor on a study for a medicine that was just approved by the Food and Drug Administration in the United States. And I said, what's the name of it? And he gave me the name of the medicine that my father-in-law had told me and I said, Wait a minute. I'm getting goosebumps again. Sorry. <laughs> me too. Me too. What are the odds? <laughs> I said, wait a minute. You were the lead doctor in that study? He said, yes, I've been working with it for a year. And I said, how did you become the lead, the lead doctor in this study? He said, well, I'm a graduate of Harvard and I'm a, you know, a fellow with whatever. And I see more um, pregnancies than most physicians do and most and so many more of them are high risk because of the malnutrition in this country and so I was chosen he said I'm gonna get you on that medicine and you should be we should be able to stop the contractions completely and we should be able to get you to full term oh my goodness and at that point, I was, I, I had to repent of all of my feelings of why did you let me come here to be here in the Philippines without medical care, without electricity, without a generator, without a respirator. And so here's God who doesn't give me just a good physician. He gives me the best in the world <laughs> in the middle of Manila. And he was able to, we, 
we started the medicine. I kept the baby um, in utero for until 38 weeks. And <clears throat> he, so I told him, and I had to stay in Manila the whole time. So I was away from my kids the whole, that, whole, the rest of that time because I had to stay in Manila where they had electricity. That's a long time. Just in case, yeah. Well, so I kept begging him and saying, so can I go back to Bacola to have the baby when I'm, when I'm, you know, like 38 weeks? He's like, you can't fly when you're 38 weeks. I said, well, if I have this pill, couldn't I fly? He would say, no, no. Well, I kept bugging him. And finally he said, okay, but I can't guarantee that you won't have the baby, you know, on the way. I said, well, my husband delivered our first baby in the car, so I'm okay with that. <laughs> he said, all right. And he said, but get in, when you get to the airport, right before the, right before the plane is going to leave, take a pill and then you should be fine. So we're sitting in the airport. I'm so eager to go home and see my other two kids. Mm -hmm. And they say, flight 234 to Bacolod. And I popped the pill, has been delayed two hours. I went, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> now what do I do? <laughs> how long does it keep? How long was it supposed four to be? Four hours. Four hours? Oh. It's a four-hour pill, and it's a one-hour flight. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so I... I looked at my husband and I said, so we've got an hour to spare <laughs> because I figured it was going to work. And I looked at him and said, are you going to be ready to deliver this baby? And he was like, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> so we, we got to the, um, we got in, we actually landed safely. There was no problem. My, my contractions did not start again. I went to my regular pediatrician and she said, yep, we're good. I said, so can I get off the medicine now? Because I'm technically full term. Mm -hmm. And she, she said, well, yeah, go ahead. You know, cause she said, I'm guessing that it will take a while before you have the baby anyway. I got off the medicine, so that was four hours, and then four hours later, he was born. Oh, my goodness. And he wasn't he huge? No. Wasn't he like 10 pounds or something? No, no, he was not. He was okay. the biggest of our children, but he was still 6'13". Oh. No, he was not huge, but he was totally perfect. There wasn't anything, <clears throat> there wasn't anything that was wrong. Um, and he now is our partner in, in real estate. So mm -hmm. that is, um, and it was, it was just so amazing to me to see how God orchestrated everything, mm -hmm. right? It, <clears throat> for my father-in-law to have read that story, Mm -hmm. the week before so that he knew that I mean he he kept up on medicine but he was retired yeah so it, it was not something that you would necessarily expect for the doctor to have been back in the Philippines after being in the United States just a week earlier who was the lead person was, in the study right. in the world <laughs> in the world I found out that he was actually the president of the Philippines personal physician. Mm -hmm. So, um, and had my OB been in the state, in, in the Philippines, I likely would have trusted her. Mm -hmm. and I likely would have delivered that baby oh my gosh. because I would have trusted her because she knew what she was doing. Yeah. But God had her leave that day and I didn't trust the person that she left in charge. So every little detail when I look back was taken care of. Mm. And 
we used to say, um, somebody told me this right before we left for the Philippines when I was feeling somewhat anxious. We're, we're quite adventurous, so it didn't seem like a huge deal. But right before we left, I realized that we were taking our nine-month-old, who was my my husband's parents' only grandson. And his mom had lived with, with Hodgkin's cancer for 25 years. Mm -hmm. um, and so we were taking her only grandchild to the Philippines and my parents were, were there and someone said to me, the hand, the will of God will not take you where the hand of God cannot keep you. And when I reflect back on that story of Jason's birth, mm -hmm. I see evidence of that. You know, God called us there. He showed us very clearly once we had made the decision to go by having our house sell to the first person who looked at it at our asking price. You know, it, there were just many, many instances where God said, this is what I want you to do. Mm -hmm. And then I still doubted it when, you know, life came at me. <clears throat> I still was frustrated or angry with him because I figured if I had been in the States, I would be able to keep this pregnancy. That was what my head was telling me. Mm -hmm. and God said, no, I've got it. I've got the best in the world for you. That is spectacular. Yeah. So looking back on this, I mean, even the part where even your friends that had your stuff for you in storage, like sometimes you think, well, I think this is God's will. And then when things just start just, just walking out so easily, you can see looking back how he was, his hand was so, so actively involved. I mean, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So what do you say to someone, um, you know, looking back on all of it, I guess you kind of said the takeaway, um, someone who is in a position where they can't really understand why things are happening the way they are. Maybe they are angry with God. I mean, after you going through this, what would be your, your big takeaway message? I think the, <clears throat> the point, I, I think through this experience and, and a a couple of other experiences that God just were, they were absolutely miracles. I have come to realize that I don't, I don't need to fear. Mm -hmm. I, I, and I don't need to overthink what's going on. I need to acknowledge that God is there and that he has the control and I have to give it to him. I have to put it in his hands. And sometimes that's hard, right? It's hard. So for me, I'm a, I'm a visual person. I'm sort of um, expressive dance, those kinds of things. So for me, I literally have to put my hands out in front of me mm -hmm. and and whatever it is that's bothering me, I kind of visualize it on my hands, and then I give it back up to God. And sometimes I need to do that 10 times a day. Mm -hmm. But as a part of that act, and a, as a part of refusing to allow fear and anxiety to take over, mm -hmm. I, I, I literally, I am not going to allow that to take over. And it was in part because of what I was shown in this experience, right? I don't, I didn't understand why she was going to be gone, that why the OB was going to be gone. I didn't understand. And I couldn't control it. Mm -hmm. But knowing that God 
did helps me now. And when I, you know, I fall in that, in that path still, you know, regularly where things can start to, you know, they just start to worry or you just have on your shoulder, you have that little voice saying, that's not how, that's not how, you're not good enough, that's not good enough. It's not, he's not strong enough. I just have to refuse to listen and literally give it back to God. Wow. That's excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. I know you said you had some other miracles too. So maybe we'll be catching up with you again. Um, <laughs> another episode. I look forward to that. It's, I love it when guests say that like, well, yeah, even my first lady, um, Miss Evelyn Egan, my first guest, you know, once we got into the interview, before the interview, she said, you know, actually there's, there's lots. <laughs> it's so <laughs> right that you hear someone say that. It's like amazing, you know, to have mir true miracles. Um, right. But I'm so grateful for this testimony. And um, it's just amazing to be, you know, in a whole different country on the other side of the world and to, for the odds of God to provide you with the number one person to save your baby's life, because that's what happened. Exactly. And, you know, and to, you know, it's, it's, I think it's so beautiful too, when you can, you can reflect back on that. Cause we're, we're always going to have, you know, struggles and trials and you know, being a Christian or, you know, believer, um, doesn't mean you're immune to difficulties and hardships. Right. And, you know, I think it's important that when we're going, when we're in the next one to remember and reflect back, you know, I, I catch myself all the time saying to my kids, you know, have I ever let you down, you know, in the car <laughs> heading somewhere and they're like, well, we, you didn't do this or, and I, it's, the minute I say it, like I, maybe I'm in a struggle myself. And the minute it comes out of my mouth, it's, I, it's like, yeah, okay. I heard, <laughs> I heard it myself, you know, but, uh, <laughs> but it's, easy. Right. you know, it's neat to, um, to really make yourself aware, like think back to when, okay, you got me through it. I'm going to get through this again, you know, and it does strengthen your faith the more that that happens. So, um, so grateful for this. And, um, I hope everyone felt inspired. Um, is there any last thing that you want to say? You did such a I just job. want to say thank you for following God's call to do this. Oh, it's a really neat way to build his kingdom and to encourage other people. Oh, thank you very much. It's, it's, you know, it's a joy to be a vessel. So as long as he keeps providing, I will keep doing the best that I can. So thank you for that. Amen. And if you have a miracle that you would like to share, um, please reach out to me at everydaymiraclespodcast.com. You can also email me at everydaymiraclespodcast at gmail.com. And we're on iTunes, Facebook, uh, Instagram, and we're, we're getting started on YouTube. It's been an adventure. So thank you so much for listening and uh, God bless.